we actually executive produced one of the first films. The first. The first film that Dion Taylor yep. and Ephraim Salam ever put in production. Hey, Crockett's Corner and my Corner Peeps. This show, man, I, I don't even know where I begin with this guy. This guy I met a long, long time ago. Actually, he came into the league in the NFL in 1998. Yeah, we a little bit old. 1998, where he was actually the first rookie to start 19 games, play in the Super Bowl, and he was one of the youngest rookies, maybe the youngest rookie, to actually start in the Super Bowl at 22 years old. This guy has done so much, man. Wait, wait till you see within this hour. It's going to come at you hard, straight with no chaser. But he's done a lot. Welcome to Crockett's Corner, my man, Ephraim Salon. My guy. How you doing? I'm my good, man? man. I'm good. Man, look. You, well, I, let me I, just say this. You look good. I appreciate All right? that, and man. You look good. Yo. You always kept in shape. You've always looked good. It looked like you can still go man. a little bit. No. Right? One no. quick back pedal. <laughs> one. I, I got one pedal. You got one pedal. <laughs> For real. No, but on the real, man, this is just amazing because as you can see, my corner peeps, this is not in Dallas. We're not at the normal studios. We are actually in Santa Monica at the Hidden Empire. And let me tell you, it is a Hidden Empire. <laughs> but it's so special to me and it's near and dear to me because of another reason as well. Me and this man right here, like I said, we met a long time ago. And I'm, I'm going to go forward then back. Okay. All right. We actually... Executive produced one of the first films. The first. The first film that Dion Taylor yep. and Ephraim Salam ever put in production. Yes. And, and I'm proud to say I was happy with it and I was amazed. And you played a part in and, it. You and had I a did. role. I we, gave a you a speak, <laughs> we gave you a speaking part. Hey, I got my side cord. <laughs> But no, on, on the real though, I just remember I used to call it the Dust Bowl. Yeah. Because y'all was in Sacramento and everywhere we went, it was dusty it's as just hell. Dust. And man, this right here, we're going to get to it later and just all how it well is put together and, and what it is now. But I'm going to go back to you for a minute. Let's go back. Let's go back early, early. early Coming early. out of SAT. Mm -hmm. Went to Florin High School. Yep. Am I saying it correctly? Yep. Florin, Florin High okay, School. Okay, went to Florin High. Basketball, football. football. Then. Transition into San Diego State. Yep. Now let's let's go in high school for a okay. Minute. Which one was your first love, basketball or football? Um. So the story with me in sports was I didn't play any. I didn't play sports. I didn't play Pop Warner. I didn't play Little League. I didn't play rec ball. I played nothing. Really. Ninth grade year, I had a friend. He was the only kid in our neighborhood who had a a, a, a Nintendo. Right, and we were all summer. We were playing the Legend of Zelda. Summer between eighth, eighth grade and ninth grade, Legend of Zelda. We almost were done. First day of school. At the end of school, I'm out by the gym waiting on him so we can go home and finish the Legend of Zelda. Wait, wait. You won't participate. You chilling? I'm chilling. I'm ready. <laughs> we. I'm ready to go play the video game. <laughs> he comes out full football pads. Uh -huh. I'm like, where, where you going? He, my dad signed me up for football. So he was like, I got, I got like two hours. I sit outside in the back of our school on the bleachers while they're out there playing football for two hours, practice. And after the end of the practice, he came over. His name was John Hellman. He came over with the coach uh -huh. and was like, hey, it's freshman ball. Hey, this is my friend Ephraim. Can he play football with us? And the coach looked at me. He was like, do you want to play football, son? And I was just like, uh... Yeah. How, how big were you at this time? I was I wasn't just like, a normal I, kid. I, I'm just like five nine. Oh yeah, you know you're a normal I mean? kid. Yeah, a normal kid. And he was like, You ever played before? I was like, No. He was like, Do you want to play? And I was like, Yeah. John was like, I was like, Yeah, so sure. So he gave me the forms, go home, get the medical sign. Right. Two days later, I'm at football practice. So you that was that was didn't have a love for football. No, either. man. Wow. That was that was my introduction to playing uh sports right. in in high school and I played nose guard. They didn't know where to I had never played before. So you they were raw. like you was raw too. So you hey, weren't carry the ball. Line up in front of this ball <laughs> and when it moves, wherever it go, you go find where that ball goes and you and, and you make the play. Wow. I tell you one of my first early plays when my coach looked at me and was like, hmm, I'm there and I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's gonna snap the ball. Right. And I can see Anybody who knows football knows how close that is. Yeah. I'm the nose guard. Yeah, you're right on top of the ball. I'm, I'm right on top yeah. of the ball. And I, the quarterback and the center's 
feet are next to each other. So I thought in my head, I said, when he snaps the ball, I bet I can grab the quarterback before he backpedals. <laughs> Snap the ball, I dive underneath and just grab the quarterback's leg and he falls. It's a sack. Wow. And the coach was like, where'd you learn that at? Why, why did you, he said, why did you do that? And I said, well, it seemed like it was easier than letting him go with the ball and then what, whatever. So he was like, oh, okay, oh, all right. Um, so then I moved out to three technique. Then they moved me out to defensive end. Then I got called up. Right. I got moved up from freshman to, J to JV. Right. We only, it was a brand new high school. We only had ninth and 10th grade. So we all we had was freshman and JV ball for basketball and for, for all the sports. Right. And so um, I got moved up to JV. I was 13 years old. That next year, sophomore year, I was 14. I got my first letter from a university. I didn't, I didn't even know what it was. You kidding me. Swear to God. The University of Illinois, the fighting the lion eye. And my coach called me into the uh, office. He was like, hey, I got something for you. He gave it to me. I was like, what is this? He said, I'm going to read it, man. Hey, uh, uh, Ephraim Sam, you know, well, they had the, the questionnaire. You had to fill it out, all right. of your measurements and, and, and all of that. And so I was like, wow, this is crazy. Now, my sophomore year, I played varsity. Right. So I'm defensive end. I'm linebacker. I'm all this. That's and it, 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 it just began to grow. I got just better snowballing. and better. Basketball was terrible. Dion, um, I lived with Dion. Uh -huh. So Dion is considered, I consider Dion my brother. I met Dion when I was 11 years old. We've been rocking ever since. I lived with him all through high school. Uh, and so he was like, hey man, you gotta get your fat ass up. We, got, we, we gotta go hoop. Cause all Dion would do is play, ba uh, yeah, play that's basketball. Yeah, he's a hooper. So he he's like, hooper. we would get up in the morning, we'd go out, we play uh, basketball all day. I joined the basketball team my freshman year again. I was awful. God, I was like, you want me to dribble and move? I can't. This is stupid, right? Like, I, and I already know y'all thinking to yourself, as big as he is, he got to be lying. He was playing sports. That's how it sometimes happens. I didn't start to my sophomore year, so I understand what you're saying. But I have to know this. When did the growth spurt happen, though? Because you're 5'9 as a freshman. Yeah, so at... at, at and you're 6'7 now. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I was young. The reason I was 13 and then 14, I graduated high school at 16. So I skipped two grades early on. And so I didn't have the, normally I should have been in, like, the seventh grade. Seventh grade at that time. Right. So you would have been big for a seventh grade. For a seventh grade, I would have been, I would have yeah. been, look at this kid. Yeah, you'd have been big. But I was in high school. And so I remember actively waking up and being bigger than stuff like the bed now my arm is like all the way on the ground in the bed or you can grow out of all your clothes in a year yeah, yeah. or your shoes in a year you know what i mean just so abruptly it, it was just like oh this shirt don't fit no more right like the sleeve is coming up to here and so i went from five nine to six five in four years. Wow. That that's crazy. Like it was it was And early too, because like you said, you graduated yeah, at I was 16. 16 years old. Yeah. So, so you, I was six five at sixteen. Still wasn't through growing. And still wasn't through growing. And so through my athletic journey, as I got older and practiced more, my abilities begin to catch up with my body. Right. I was that's why basketball was so hard for me. It was so uncoordinated. Yeah. I'm like, man, I can't dribble this ball and move and shoot in that little bitty thing. I can't, I can't do it. It was just too much because I, I, my body wasn't coordinated enough to do it. So you left, they had a promising high school career, mm -hmm. one city all caught up to you, yep. and, and ended up several, several scholarship offers. Yeah, I got recruited by a 88 Division I schools for basketball and football. You hear that? 88. I look, 88. I got recruited for five. <laughs> we, ended up in the, we ended up in the same place. We ended up in the same place. But look, but that was because I was 6'5 and I was 16, 6'5 and 185 pounds. So what whether I was good enough or not, all they saw was the potential. Yeah, they, they saw like, projection. We can do yes. anything with yes. that. 6'5, yes. 185 and 16. Yes. 
Yeah. We could do anything. Yeah, it, it's all about your projection. At that's, that all, point. That's, that's all it was. Yeah. And so, and so you go to San Diego State. You What's actually it? play on the football and basketball yes, team I at did. San Diego State. Yeah. So to hear him say he was horrible. Yeah. Somehow, some way. Oh, oh, it, 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 it clicked. It clicked. It clicked. And, and when did that happen? It clicked the, the summer between my junior and senior year. I spent, I never went to a football camp and all of that, but I spent all my time playing basketball with Dion. Mm. So he was a guard. We were on the AAU team together. We were on the Nike All-American team together in basketball. And all I did was play basketball all day, every day. Naturally, I was just good in football. Right. Basketball, I really wanted to work. And you be had to good work at it, yeah. Because Dion would talk so much shit, and so now I, we got to. <laughs> and we, Dion talk a lot of shit. Oh, he talk a lot of shit, and he can play. So we, were, oh, he can really play. <laughs> he can play, especially at that time. Yeah. And so we would just go at it all day long. But what that did was it accelerated my growth in the sport. Right. So now I can handle the ball like a like a guard because I'm used to playing with a guard. Mm -hmm. I got to mm -hmm. keep the ball away from him. I can guard him. Because now, yeah, right, so lateral movement, all that stuff. Yeah. My senior year, I started one year in high school in basketball. Uh, averaged 24 points, 12 rebounds. Wow. That was just, that was. That's major. That was it. And, and after that, it was just like, oh, okay, well, what do, what do you want to do? You want to play football? You want to play basketball? So I like to do both. And people ask me, you got recruited by all these schools. Right. Why San Diego State? And I was my, I, did they, was that the only school that said you could do both? Nope. Dion was the first person at Florin High to get a Division I scholarship in the history of the school, brand new school. He went to San Diego State on a full ride basketball scholarship. And now you want I, to be with your boy. When he signed his scholarship, I already knew where I was going. It, it was it was no doubt. It didn't matter who was coming, what right. school. I mean, Cal, uh, uh, every UCLA, uh, Stanford, Florida, and all Stanford. those schools. I, I, and and, and mind you, let, let me let them know because mm -hmm. What he alluded to earlier was how astute he was as well. Oh, well yeah. <laughs> because for you to think I can reach under the center oh, yeah, yeah. and grab the quarterback's leg before, that's that's playing smart. Yeah. And you were a very astute player. So you got you got recruited by all the top. Every, every, yeah. Everywhere. Yeah. But I knew I was going there uh, because he went there. And right. that was our dream growing up. We always talked about going to the school together and, and, and doing that. And that was something we were able to do. Anything we've dreamt of together? Yeah, we're gonna get to that. Look, you know what I mean? You we're gonna, know. Look, he he's already prefacing what, what we're gonna talk about later because they had a vision and, and it definitely came true. Let's let's go. When did you decide to make I guess make the switch? Because it's all about change and pivots yes. and, and yeah. that fork in the road. Mm -hmm. So you have a fork in the road right now in San Diego State because yes. you're balling, you're hooping, and you're playing football. Yes. When um, did you decide left or right? My dad sat me down and he said, look, you're, you're really good at both of these sports. Right. Eventually, you're going to have to pick one. Exactly. So let's talk about it. He had a, a yellow mead uh, notepad and we drew a line right down the middle. Uh-huh. And we put pros and cons of basketball. I and love football. it. Swear to God. I love it. And the most glaring thing for me coming from like an analytical space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was at the time, I believe it was 30 NBA teams and 30 NFL teams. And it was only 12 players on the NBA, on team. the NBA team yep. and 53 on an NFL. The team. odds are much better. And I was like, I mean, I'm pretty sure I can go to the NBA, but I know <laughs> I can go. Yeah. I yeah. know I'm good enough to be one of those, one of 53. those 53. Yeah. And that really was a deciding factor on which sport I was going to lean into more because I would, like I said, I was 6'5", 185 pounds, I had 38 inch vertical. I could do anything in the world on the basketball court, but I made the decision and I gained a hundred pounds in, in, uh, in college. In to college play football. To play. And that's what I was about to say. Cause that's the hardest thing. That was like me running track mm -hmm. and playing football. You have to make a decision because you got to get strong. Yes. As you know, you can't go out there being no. no, no you no, got to no. get strong. So you had to make that. Yeah. But what I like about that, what you just said, and, and this is what I wanted to explain to the kids out there. He basically did a vision board mm -hmm. without having a vision board. Nothing happens in life when if you don't write it down. No, you got. I look tell at people it. all the time, if you don't write it down, you keep it in your head. It's a dream. Yeah. 
But once you become gotta the right, you got to look at it so you, you can see. So you looked at it, mm-hmm. took the route. You, we know you were successful in college. Yes. Let, let's go straight to the pros because mm-hmm. I'm going to get to the back end of your life as well. Okay. But going to the pros, just so happened he gets drafted in 1998 yep. after a successful career. You go in the seventh round. Mm-hmm. Now, now, let's talk a little bit about that. Just a seven round. I was pissed off. The, I, 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 I know you had to be. Crack, I was mad. Yeah, because this is the guy who, who was, never faltered was, in anything. I'm, I'm mad. I'm like, what, what? So, leading up to the draft, you know, I spent a lot. The Jets, the New York Jets scout actually lived in San Diego. Mm-hmm. We spent a lot of time together. He was at my workouts. We having sandwiches and lunches. And the draft is coming up. And back then, it was two days. First right. three rounds on the first day on Saturday and you know four through seven, four through seven on, yeah. on Sunday so he said look I think you'll be a terrific fit for the New York Jets you want to come I said yeah I'm, I'm trying to ball yeah so he said okay they go back it's draft day I get a call from him on draft day right first round went by second round went by I was like cool they have like an early pick in the third round he mm-hmm. was like hey we're gonna draft you wow are you ready to be a New York Jet I'm excited, family. We all sell Dion. We all there celebrating, and I'm waiting. You know the agents and you know, sitting there. Yeah, because the there's some. There's, now, we, now, we, now, mind we, you, there's some time. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. That call. There's there's enough time to change your mind. You yo, it, it was changed. <laughs> Hell, it, it, however long that was, it, it was changed. So I'm sitting there, and you know they call you, and then the, they give the card in. Like right. it's so it's happening real time. And so I'm watching, and uh, the pick is in New York Jets. Uh, they, they're walking up to come. I'm looking at the come, looking at my agent. Yeah. I'm like, was it You're like, phone and ring it. Uh, the New York Jets select Jason Fabini, left tackle out of I can't even remember what school. And I, my my soul just erupted. It just it's, left it's my done. mind. Yeah, yeah. That the rest of that round goes off. And then not only that, you have to wait a day. A whole day. A whole Couldn't sleep. That's what I was about to say. How was that night? Fourth round, fifth round, sixth round. Now I'm like, oh, I'm not going to even get drafted. I started getting phone calls from teams to become free, free agent. agent. You know, you can, this this is a great opportunity. Uh, you can pick you can pick wherever you want to go. Yeah. Uh, we want you to come here. Uh, you have a great opportunity. So I'm I'm. It's just me and Dion left. No more family. No. Everybody's gone. I said we got <clears> which man. is which is funny that you yeah. mentioned that because that's what happens in life. When, look, when you when you're making the money and all that stuff, you have they a whole know. everybody everybody <laughs> celebrating. Everybody want to be in the picture. Everybody want to know. But when it don't go like it go, they out of there. So now you alone, you and Dion alone. Me and Dion, I said, man, I got to get out of here. Let's go. We going to the movies. We in the car. Drive the, the draft is still on. Yeah. The you don't seven, care. Seven round. I, I I have I have no interest. I get a call on the way to the movie theater. Hey, uh, Ephraim, this is Art Shell. I said, hey, man, I'm thinking it's a free agent. Right. He was like, like hey, I ain't I'm, ready to decide yet. Yeah, I, I'm just calling to let you know we're getting ready to draft you uh, to be an Atlanta Falcon. I was like, well, what, what pick is it? He was like, you're not watching the draft? I said, nah, man, I'm, 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 I'm pissed uh, off. Yeah, yeah. He said, well, it's the 199th pick, and um, do you want to be an Atlanta Falcon? I said, you, y- yes. Yes, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> and he said, and, I, and I'm glad you're mad. So I've been trying to draft you for since yesterday. Wow. And um, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come in here and prove not only to us, but to everybody in this league why you should have been drafted higher. Yeah. You okay with that? I said, absolutely. And, and, and let me just tell the world, he did more than prove that. <laughs> because coming in, and, and as a young guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Coming yeah. in as a young guy, I remember it, and... and I hate to say it, unfortunately they had to face us in the Super Bowl, but that's another we got, story. We just skipped all, we got all <laughs> the way there. Got, no, that's another story. We, we gonna go, we gonna go to you coming in and 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 going straight to training camp. It's not likely mm-hmm. that a seven round pick, very unlikely, would would not even start, but would make the team. Yeah, I just wanted to make the team. Yeah, exactly. So when when how did that training camp go? And I, I tell you what, we, we're, we're going to talk about it because I know I can see it in your face. Yeah. You got 
<laughs> oh, yeah. You got oh, a lot yeah. to talk about there. Yeah. We're going to come back. And as y'all can see, man, this story is going to be up and down, ins and out, trials, tribulations, the whole nine. Everything Crocker's Corner is about. We'll be back. We're going to pay some bills. We'll be back. All right, my Crockett, look, Crockett's Corner crew, this is this story is getting good, man. I, I, I'm i going to jump right into it. Okay. You get in the training camp, yep. seven-round draft pick. All the things on your mind right now, the yes. only thing is, how can I make this team? How did it transition into what happened your rookie year? I, the, thing that, the thing that I was worried about going into camp, I was, I was light. I was only 285 pounds. This is back when you know, massive offensive yeah, tackles. They, I was three ten. I was actually at the combine with like Victor Riley from Auburn, who was like six six, three forty. Wow. Um, uh, Flozell Adams, Flozell the Hotel. Yeah, yeah. He was six nine, three fifty five. <laughs> right. Trey Thomas from Florida State was six six, three forty five. Right. Like, and then me, two eighty five. Two eighty five. Right. And, and, and so they and were like, was that way? Was we, that part of the reason why you went so late, though? Well, well, do you think? Well, you know, it, it it was a time of huge offensive line, right? And the skill level was there, obviously, but I was small, right? Uh, and teams, I guess, wanted I was maybe a project, mm -hmm. right? In a couple of years, we put some pounds on them, then we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll yeah, which okay, I get, I understand. But going into training camp, my my my, fo my first thing was, I want to see if I can, if I belong here. Right. Right. I'm here. Yeah, you're 21. You're young. Now, too. do I belong here? Right. So we get into practice, we do one on ones and all of that, and get somebody down. You're like, oh, wait, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You're like, you're, you're like, like, wait, you're like, a wait a minute. Wait, like, <laughs> wait, did I do that? Do another one. And you're like, okay, <laughs> right. And 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 things started to, to go well for me. Right. I'll never forget, they brought in a, a tackle, Corey Lucci from Buffalo, been in the league five years. They brought him over. Uh, Lincoln Kennedy had left and went to the Raiders. Right. And right tackle spot was open. They brought Corey Lucci in, and Corey was huge, man. He was like 6'8", 325, somebody was huge. Wow. And so I'm like, he was the starter. I was like third string left tackle behind mm -hmm. Bob Whitfield and somebody else. And and so Corey got hurt, pulled his groin. Yeah. And so we had to shuffle the line. I'll never forget, Art Shell, we're in our meeting room, calls us up to the board, each one of the young players, young mm -hmm. rookies, and first year players. He was testing us. He was calling out plays. Trying and we to had to go to the board yeah. and draw up the plays, trying to see who he was going to move over. Mm hmm. So I remember going up there, he called out a play, I drew up, I drew everybody. Receivers, I drew tight ends, yeah. the, the running That's back, where that comes. I yeah. drew everybody. <laughs> Art was like, he like, we only wanted the line. He was like, you just have to do lines, all right, what's the, erase, what's the next play? I drew, I drew everybody again. Quarter, you know how the little quarterback drive, yeah. three step, five step, I'm writing five step down. Like, he was like, you from your second team, right tackle. This whole camp, I've been playing left tackle. Um, second team, right tackle, um, and now that means I get playing time. Yeah. So when the when now when, now it goes from not making the team. Now, now you thinking now I got a shot. Yeah, I got a shot to be a starter. So, so we, yeah. we go to preseason, and you know I'm a left tackle. I'm not a right tackle. But I was out there like if I get in this game, if I get in this preseason it's game, it's on and popping, <laughs> right? So early on. You get to you second string. You get to play. Yeah, yeah. You so in the second I, half of the I game. I go out there. I'm just I'm I'm competing. Technique is shit. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I, but I'm competing. Yeah. I'm doing everything I can to keep him, this guy off the quarterback. We do that. Get down to the last preseason game. Art Shell comes. Up, Corey's back. Right. Art Shell comes before the game. We play in Cincinnati Bengals. He says, hey, Corey, you're going to start. Ephraim, you play the second quarter. Corey, you play the third. Ephraim, play the fourth. Whoever plays the best will be starting next week against Carolina, opening day. And I that's said, how it's you going down. Damn, I put that motherfucking chin <laughs> strap. You're like, you're like, I'm about the to The whole stand. first quarter, I'm just standing. I got my whole helmet, mouthpiece <laughs> in. Motherfucker's like, Ephraim, you can sit down. I'm like, I couldn't wait. Yeah. Now, the thing I tell you is, and this is all about mentality and, and perspective, Corey was mad. 
Because he had to, because he had to battle. Because he had to compete. Exactly. So he went into it like, why do I have to compete? I've already earned mine. And I went into it like, oh, I'm about to get this. And I want to start see, just that mindset, that change of of one word. I have to, and I get to. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I have to is a position of I've made it. Yeah. I get to is a position of I'm trying to make I'm it. I'm getting it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Man. And, and we went in that game. I, I played, I was probably the best football I had played up until that point. So tell me this. How, how much of your basketball? Oh, I was, my feet were uh, immaculate. Yes. Couldn't get around me. Yeah, hey, we used to call you tippy toe. Yeah, man. Couldn't yeah. get around me. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm with, wherever and, you want to go, and, I'm, and, I'm I, and I want the kids to know that because mm-hmm. where I'm from in Texas. Yeah. Everybody is trying to go one sport. One That's sport, it. One you got to play all you, of them, man. Man, you got to do everything. Because it helps. It's going to help. Yeah. On my on my my draft board, the positives were great hands, great feet, play basketball. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Undersized. My negatives were undersized, light, uh, you know, uh, t- on his toes a lot, yeah. like quick on his feet. Yeah. Um, But that helped me. Because now I use my knowledge. My whole trick was if I can make the defensive player think something that's, that's something not else, gonna, yes, then yes. I, I can put him where I need him to be. Yeah. So I started playing with my stance. I started giving false re Like this is the cerebral approach that I was using at a young age to give me a, a, a leg up. I love it. Yeah. Because that's how I got my start. I, the fact that I knew all of the positions and mm-hmm. all the how to draw the play. That's what got me that that opportunity. And when I got the opportunity, I didn't let it go. And then that next week, they actually that next day, I remember coming down. Corey was walking past me. I was like, what's up, Corey? He didn't say shit to me. They had already told him. So I go down. I'm eating. We having a team meeting. I'm in the meeting. And you know, that last cut, it, it, everybody, it, it half the room gone. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, shit, Corey. He's going to be late for the meeting. And Art Shell was at the door. He said, Even, let me talk to you for a second. So they I cut him? Out, I come out. I said, uh, what's up, Art? <laughs> he said, look here, man. Um, you're going to be our starting right tackle uh, this week coming up against uh, Carolina. Congratulations. He said, tell you two things. Don't be afraid to be uh, great. And don't go out there and shit down your leg. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, OK. And I was like, well, where's Corey? And he said we cut him. Yeah, I said, "Word." Yeah, they just at the time they just gave him like, I don't know, like a half a million dollars to come over a signing bonus mm-hmm. and all of that, and that was a lesson to me. Yeah, for sure. Right. This for is sure. when the league was we're going to put the the best eleven players on the on the field no matter what and the ones with the best attitude you know what i mean yeah because that because that's not a team that he went in it with like i said with a different mindset yeah yeah and you had the right mindset man, i'm trying and, to and, eat and, and let me tell you about but once again man had a, a tremendous career to just to think about where he came from mm-hmm. not even playing football and all that stuff ended up being the youngest player to start in the super bowl which was his rookie year started every game yeah, started man. every game. 19. That's a, that's a grind. Started 19 games. And, and we were the same. We because yeah. they were 14 and 2. We were 14 and 2. Yeah. And look, we ain't gonna talk about the outcome. We'll just skip over the outcome, sir. No, wait, no, you know what? Damn, is that what we gonna do? <laughs> look, we, look we, we, we could talk about the outcome. <laughs> I, I look in that journey, we got you gotta remember there was a third team in this scenario. Yeah, Minnesota. That was uh, all world. And we didn't want them. I know I y'all. Didn't, I know y'all didn't we want. Didn't want. <laughs> you know what? The crazy thing is, I talk to Rod Rod Smith about this yeah. all, all the time because you know, four years after that, I end up going to play for yeah, the you end up with the Broncos, yeah. Um, and so when we played against Minnesota in the NFC Championship game, Minnesota was fifteen and one. They scored more points than any team in NFL history. Yeah. Randy Moss's rookie year, the Chris reemergence Carter, of oh of, my of, god, Jake the, Reed, and you know. all. Woo. The re <laughs> the reemergence of Randall Cunningham, like yeah. that boy dropped back and let that ball go. It was crazy. They had Robert Smith as as a running back. They had yeah. they had everything. Yeah. Um. And we went to Minnesota, one of the loudest stadiums on the planet Earth, mm-hmm. and we beat them. 
Dude, that that basically, I'm gonna be honest. That was a Super Bowl. I, that's all I was about that to say. Super Bowl. And my we mind had, said that was y'all Super Bowl. We had y'all nothing left in the tank. It was over. It, and, it was and, over. I, and I tell people this. I tell people. I said, you don't understand the level of mentality, oh. mental, physical, emotional that gets up for a game like it's that. It's impossible to do it again. Twice? It's impossible, man. And, and that's it's exactly impossible. what we said. When we when we saw you Y'all guys won the game. Ron told me that. He was like, yeah, we, we got another we one. Like this. We got another one. Back to back. It's, 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 uh, it's automatic. Yeah, that's It's that, automatic. Yeah, so, in hindsight, you know. Yeah, hindsight. One, fuck you. Uh, number two. <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, fuck with me. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, no hey, and, and that, but that's, I mean, yeah, that's, that's it, man. Yeah, yeah, that's the beauty of it. But so you, you have, like I said, a tremendous career, man. You played 13 years. Yeah, which man. It's crazy. To, for anybody, once you get a decade, you play a decade, it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, you, 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 you did your thing. Because not only did you make it, you stayed. I was about to say the NFL, you guys have heard it. Not, Not for long. long. That's what it stands for. The average career is three years. You're talking about two guys here who are fortunate enough to play a decade plus. Yeah, man. And, and which is, is rare within itself. So now, let's talk about a little bit toward the end. I mean, everybody yeah. know you were special mm-hmm. on the field. They, they can look it up. Let's talk about when did you start to decide and start to just transition your mind away this from is the game? Blow, this is going to blow your mind. My rookie year. <laughs> Hell no. You was going in and going listen, out at the same time. <laughs> listen, listen. After all the success, I was still a seventh round draft pick. Right. So my mentality was, they'll always try to replace you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I swear to God. The first thing that I got offered in that historic Super Bowl run for Atlanta was, I was asked to come be a guest on a radio show, uh, V103 in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. It was Portia Fox. She had this show on Fridays and so I went and I was a, a host I mean a, a guest and it was great got to talk to fans it was, I get home they call me it was like hey would you want to do this every Friday we can call it you know Falcon Fridays with even Salon Porsche Fox you know leading up to the playoffs and and, right. and, all, and I was like yes so I got into broadcast in 1998 wow. on the radio first thing loved it Loved interacting with the people, all of that. Mm-hmm. The next year, I was like, I want to do it again. So I just I got into it, started doing little TV spots mm-hmm. locally. So the bug like bitch. That. And I was like, oh, oh, wait, this I can I yeah. can turn this into if I play two years in the league, this I can be a career. Right. Like I can turn this into something. So I, the will start turning there as I'm focused on still building out my my NFL career. Uh-huh. I'm like, okay, what well, I want to look at the other avenues, right? This is pre social media. This isn't. It wasn't 500 channels. It right. was none of that. Yeah, right. No, no podcast. No, 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 no. <laughs> and there was no place where an offensive lineman was doing anything on television or radio. Right. Nowhere. There were no offensive linemen. Doing anything, so you found your be, niche because already. the the position didn't warrant that. Right. Nobody knows who we are. We and and quite frankly, our, our linemen they didn't even they talk. didn't even talk. No, they didn't even talk. They so, didn't even talk. So you're right. When we get to when I went to Denver, we'll yeah. talk about yeah. h- how much that cost me. How, how it changed. Um, but that that was really the 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 first time where I was like, oh okay, I got to start thinking past the field. Now, now, even we we talked about you preparing for mm-hmm. wartime of peace. You started doing some broadcasting and everything. Mm-hmm. That's in Atlanta. Yeah. But then you went to a team that I played for, the Denver Broncos. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit different. The linemen there don't really say much. Did, did, did that put a muzzle on you for a while? Did it did it stunt your growth? No, it it, you know, in reality, it was, um, when I went there, you our linemen couldn't talk, and it right. cost you. Like we had a fine system. Every time you talk to a reporter, it costs you money and all mm-hmm. of that. When I went there, I had a TV and a radio show. So you wanted the only guy talking. The only one. And so I paid a fine every week. I think at the end of the first year, I spent thirty two thousand dollars in fines. So you wanted to look, you wanted to expand yes. that bad. That bad. It cost you- me thirty two thousand dollars in fines, self imposed fines within the offensive line room. Because I knew where I wanted to go. 
And, and see that that's man. I, I love this because we're, we're about to get to the bigger picture, especially when it comes to vision. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you guys can see out there is that this man has always had a, a vision and some way, somehow the pro just happened to happen. Yeah, which is how God does. It. That's how it so is. your vision was always bigger. Yeah. Now you play 13 years. Yep. Successful career at one point. And, and this is the, the big change mm -hmm. and the big transition. At what point did you say, I'm good. It's time for me to take that leap. I, um, I spent one, my, I think my 12th year in the league, one unfortunate year in Detroit. I started with Detroit. I know what you're talking boy, about. Boy. <laughs> Look, I spent five years. I ain't going to call it unfortunate, but I, I know I'm, what you're It was saying. unfortunate because it was yeah. a year after they went 0-16. And, and that's unfortunate. And <laughs> so I came from Atlanta. I came from the, the, you know how Denver is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything is Success Denver. Is in I the mean, air. it's, and yeah. then you go there and that, it was just, I was like, hey, man, maybe it's time for me to do something else. Yeah. And so I started positioning myself. We had already produced our first film together. Like, this was probably f four years prior. Right, right. Because my second year in Denver was when we first started doing mm -hmm. our, our, the movie, yeah. our, the, fir the first movie. Dion called me. He was in Germany. He was like, I got an idea for a movie. And he flew out to Denver. We sat down at a Mimi's Cafe, and he had an idea, and we chopped it up. Uh -huh. And he took all of the notes and flew back out here, and somebody's cousin of a cousin who said there was a writer or something like right, that. Right. And we put this script together. And in the off season, he was like, we going to Hollywood, man. We're going to make this movie. We went around for two years. Ain't nobody trying to hear none of that. <laughs> so who, so let, let's, let's, yeah. whose idea was it? It was to, him. It was, it was Dion. Dion. I was like, a movie? What you talking about? Right. He was, he wanted, he was like, yo, man, I, I think we can do it. I did, really think we can do it. Did either one of you have, not now, knew, one thing. Yeah, I knew you had the, the broadcast background mm -hmm. already. Film? Take no writing, producing nothing, zero, zero, and to think. So y'all jip me. I'm, yeah. I'm pissed now. What I you want, talking about? I need my money back. What you talking about? I thought y'all was season vets. What? No, <laughs> we ain't know nothing. <laughs> when we look back at, 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 I tell you one thing, we always did though. We always finished a project. We never yeah. not completed a project. And I will say this: the one thing I'll say when I when I went down mm -hmm. there and got involved in it and and, and helped executive produce and. Mm -hmm. and you guys were always prepared. Yeah, yeah. That's we, the one thing I really liked about because it. Because it's, it's the training of an athlete. Right. Right? If you can train, you can get... Dion played professionally in, in, in Germany for like five years. I played in the NFL. If you can train the discipline it takes to do that, right? anything you go into, you're going to be prepared and ready to go, uh -huh. whether you know all the things you need to know or not. And that's been an asset in us building this. That's been an asset in my life, in my journey. Right. Everything I've decided to do, I've always looked at myself as a seventh round draft pick in it. Wow. Every single thing. And what that does to me mentally, it prepares, it prepares me to be great. It prepares me to be better than expected. And, and see, now uh, I have to get into it because little... Uh, we know about your broadcast. Mm -hmm. A lot of people know about that. And a lot of people know you're on TV, radio, and all mm -hmm. that. But the one thing that I didn't know that I had to do some research on, that you are a phenomenal writer. And <laughs> and, and talk about that because yeah. you had no background in writing no. either. No. And um, that's so crazy how things work for you. But talk about how you got into writing. Because this man, he wrote on the Fresh Prince, the new Fresh Prince. Yeah. He's one of the writers on it. Um, so... Uh, about five years ago, I had just had these ideas for this movie in my head. My wife was like, please just write this. You just talk about it all the time. I didn't, I was like, I don't know how to do it. For a, a gift, she got me like an introduction to screenplay writing. It was like a five week course, one, one day a week. It was at some professor's house in the arts district. So I would go on Monday and it was like two hours from like 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. And I'd be in there. Right? Like I'm just. you 35. I'm, fresh, I'm, right? I'm just in there. <laughs> right. And so it, hell, I was 40. Wow. 40. And and I was I, I learned the technique of writing. I learned how to build character, character arcs and, you know, all of these things. And then I wrote my first screenplay. It was a comedy. It was great. Loved it. I had a, a good friend of mine. She was already a writer. She co-wrote it with me. Mm -hmm. 
And then um, I had an opportunity. Uh, uh, my neighbor, our children were in a uh, good friend, Chris Collins. Uh, he's my mentor in, in writing. He's a showrunner. Uh, he was getting ready to do this show called The Continental about the hotel in the John Wick uh, movie. Right. They were going to make it a TV show for stars. And I was telling him about these ideas I had for movies. And he was like, hey, man, I want you to be a part of the writer's room. I said, what? He said, yeah, are you in the guild? I said, no, man, I, I wrote one thing that nobody ever read before. <laughs> and he was like, no, man, I want you to, to come in and be a part of the writer's room. So he, I got in, I was a staff writer uh, on a show that had nothing to do with sports. Mm -hmm. But he said, look, what you'll have in the writer's room is your life experience is unmatched by anybody I could put in that room. You've experienced things. I echo that. <laughs> you experienced things in the world that nobody in the writer's room would have been able to experience. And you know how to work well on the team. And that's all I was, it is. I was that's what just it is. about to hit that that's I was it. about to say. How important, because <laughs> for, for us as players, yeah. the one thing that I know, and, and I always talk about the transition out of the sport, mm -hmm. because it's a difficult transition. And it I don't is care def how, very difficult. I don't care how much like me. I was a multimillionaire, mm -hmm. fortunate to do a lot of different, you know, Super Bowl, with all that stuff. But the problem with that is this, and, and I'm telling the athletes that, is that when you retire, if there's one thing I can tell you guys, and he can he can echo this, is that you have to be able to humble yourself and start off at grand zero. Oh yeah, because yeah, 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 yeah. none of that shit you did in football is transferable. No, it's it, over. It, it's over. It's with. over, man. And if you can't leave it and start off at if grand you zero, hold it's be a on to that in your next life. Yeah, it will. Now it's a weight. It's going to drain you. It helped propel you, and now it will just it will it will weigh you down. So how important for you? Mm -hmm. Was it to find a new team though? Because the locker room aspect is what we really miss. Yeah. So how important was that for you to find a new team? Well, when you talk about team, you talk about, you know, Dion and I have been rocking for 30 plus years, you know, 35 years. Uh -huh. um, we're more than teammates, right? Then we have the rest of the people. Omar met him was 18. He's 43. Now. Right. Right. So we Roxanne. Yeah, because this whole crew was there on the and first move. I helped the executive. Roxanne and I are the same age. We were 14 when Deanna and I met her. Right. Right. You want to talk about a team and a family? That's right. It. I. I. These are my. This. This is it. And that's what we always preach on the football this field. Is, you to have get to, to be, the championship. You have to be. You got to be team and family. And it's, it's, it works the same way, whether it be writing, whether you be working on film. In a writer's room, it's all of us sitting around creating something that doesn't exist. Right. We've, we've talked about the success, and, and this is tremendous. It, I mean, Hidden Empire, man. I listened to you guys' vision 20 years ago. You, yeah, literally. It was about two yep. decades ago, and I and I yep. actually came down to SAC and was with you guys for about a month off and on. Mm -hmm. And I heard this vision, heard this vision. And for to see it come to fruition is amazing. But I, I have to ask you this, though, because I don't want to gloss over it mm -hmm. and act like it just happened. Yeah. Because it didn't. No. There's there's some trials and tribulations that what? you guys went through. And, and it's more that than success. Yeah, it's, and it always is. So at what moment or was there a moment that you and Dion and Roxanne, y'all been rocking mm -hmm. and y'all sit down and y'all take a drink like I'm about to now and say, this shit ain't going to work. I, I know exactly when that moment was. We had shot a film called Supremacy. Mm -hmm. It was a great film. Uh, a, it, it was uh, a, an awards type of film, right? Mm -hmm. A true story about a white supremacist getting out of jail and then 24 hours with getting out of jail, kills a cop, takes a black family hostage. Mm -hmm. Supremacy, we made that with Danny Glover, Derek Luke, Don Oliver. Uh, well, Y'all moved up. Y'all did we, real acting. Right, like we, we, yeah. we and, and this was a labor of love. And we finished it, we screened it, nobody wanted it. And, and Dion was broken as a filmmaker, as a creator. Yeah, because that was his big shot. He was broken because yeah. we finally made something where we can be like, oh, snap, this is this substance, it's a true story, it's deep. And Joe Anderson was amazing in it. And he was like, I, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. And I was like, well, I mean. This is your. This is, this is probably 20, 
this is 2014, 2013, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, so y'all, y'all was easily we, we, 15 years in the game. We was decade grinding. Yeah, yeah. And he get a call from one of our friends, Mike Epps, and he's crazy and funny on the phone. Hey, I want to do this comedy, you know, this, like, horror comedy. Right. Which was the genesis of Meet the Blacks. We shoot Meet the Blacks in, like, 12 days up in Northern California. No money. And screen it for all the studios. Everybody pass on it. And Dion decided in that moment, we're going to do it ourselves. And he put that movie out. Robert Smith, who's yep. our financial partner, yeah, was like, all right, what y'all want to do? And we paid for the screens. We leased the, the, the screens, put that movie out on like 600 screens. And it opened like number three in the world. Right, it wow. had the second per screen average under Batman versus Superman, and it did four million dollars opening weekend. It cost like nine hundred grand to make, and then it's done thirty x since, right. and we own it. Even though this has been my man mm-hmm. for years, years, for decades, I didn't know all this because I I did my thing. Yep. I started doing TV and all that, mm-hmm. and I just watched you guys from afar. And what I've seen is unimaginable, man. And and almost, which is how life happens, mm-hmm. they almost quit. Yes. They almost quit. Yeah. We're real. And I tell people this, right when you think you're going to quit, maybe you should push a little harder. Well, so what you guys doing? And tell me how you guys went from a $4 million movie, mm-hmm. being a success, finally making it, yep. to getting this, this empire as we talk. When we... When Meet the Blacks did what it did, it ended up doing 10 million total at at the box office. Every studio was like, who the hell are these guys? What's going on over there? (laughs) Right? Because now they've shown that they can make a movie for nothing. nothing, Because nothing moves a meter like money. What? (laughs) So now Dion was just getting all, he was getting inundated with all these offers and like people were calling all of the studios that passed. And now it was more like, okay, well, what do we want to do, right? right? We've cracked the code. Distribution has always been a crooks in everybody's side, especially for African-American filmmakers. You can make a movie, but get, to get people to see it, right. you got to remember, this is pre-Netflix, pre-any of that. Mm-hmm. You, it used you actually to be, had to go to the movies. It used to be either it's going to be in a movie theater or straight to DVD. Right. And Dion never wanted to make a straight to DVD movie. Like yeah. He was like, we ain't going straight to DVD. Because yeah, that kind of chumps your brain. It does. Yeah. And so once we found out that you can actually lease the screens and put movies in the movie theater, then we can like, oh, we can make anything and just put it out. Yeah. We could just put it out to the masses. And so it became a situation where it was like, all right, so what do you want to do next? And he was like, I got this idea for this movie called Traffic, right? It was about sex trafficking, right. with Paula Patton, Omar Epps. It's great. So we go grind it, shot it up in Northern California. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? We go grinding out and shoot that. It gets a little buzz. Dion hooks up with one of the best cinematographers in the world, sent him an email. They met. Now they're... You know, he does all our movies. Right. Uh, Dante Spinotti, uh, uh, Academy Award nominated cinematographer, Last of the Mohicans, Heat, uh, LA Confidential. Like now he's doing so our that, small So now y'all get real people. Yeah. It's real. It's, you get, that's it's why the real movies now. look like yeah, that. Yeah, it's real now. Oh, yeah. And, and so that just opened up the avenue, right? So Robert, who is our financial partner in this, now he can see it, it's there. It's tangible. Yeah. So now four million, five million dollars for a film. We know that it's gonna bring X back. Mm-hmm. Right mm-hmm. now the business is profitable. Now you can pick and choose what you want to do. And Dion chose for his first studio movie through Sony was Black and Blue with Naomi Harris yeah. and major major movie. Major movie. And so. With that, it really propelled Hidden Empire into what you see now. Right. Right? We got a project we're doing here. We got podcast areas. We, Crazy. This is a one-stop shop production company. That's the full circle moment. So, so this is what I like to do when I'm, when I'm closing my show because I always, I always want 
kids out there to never stop. My whole tagline is pray, dream, believe, mm -hmm. work. And for you, what do you tell someone out there who, who has a vision but just don't know where to go? Nobody knows what you're willing to do mm -hmm. to get to where you want to go. Right? right? Not your mama, your daddy, your cousin, sister. Yeah, because sometimes niece, you got to leave family teacher. too. Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. Nobody's going to believe in your dream more than you. Mm -hmm. And if they do, then you don't want it. It's right? Not, it's not yours anymore. It's not yours. Yeah. We want to create a world where nothing's impossible. Right. Right? Right. And that, that is the sole purpose of what's driving us to grind like this. Mm -hmm. and, and see, and that's, and that's why I always tell them, look, when you have a vision, and if your vision seems mm -hmm. too big or whatever, you got to keep doing it. Keep dreaming it. Because if your vision is right, you have the vision, God will provide the pro, which was Robert Smith. Yep. And y'all didn't even know it was coming. Y'all no, just, 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 just kept working. Yeah. You just kept working with your vision. So, so what I want to do, I just, I just think to myself, I said, okay, What's next? What's next for what's next for hidden empire? Because y'all not hidden no more. No. Now no, y'all just right. an empire. What's People next? Know. Um, I wanna um, I wanna really take over TV. I um, I'm gearing myself up to become a creator and a showrunner. Okay. And what that means is I have projects that I have in development that will pitch, will sell, and I'll run it. I'll, I'll just like uh, Shonda Rhine, uh -huh. right? Or Kenya Burris, right? I am going to take over television. I got a toast to you. I got oh, a my toast God. to you. Because everything that you have done, man, and, and I tell people all the time, you're never too old to start over. You're never too young to dream big. Mm -hmm. You've done all that. You, you've dreamed big at, at a young age, started over at 40, created something new. Yep. And, and I just tell y'all, look, you can accomplish anything if you do four things. Say it with me now. Pray, Pray dream, dream, believe, believe work. and work. That's it, straight with no chaser. My God. <laughs>